welcome to 700 Club. Bill's in three. That's my prediction. What do you think? Dream <laughs> on. Skins all the way. Well, now listen, this team, that we, we've got one of the most interesting Super Bowl matchups, uh, I think, this year, because there's a lot of uh, possibility here for, for some good conflict and for some good playing. But, you know, the Bills are used to that cold weather, so I think it's going to be Bills in three. I'm absolutely convinced. Skins are ready for anything. Yes. The plane indoors anyway. Well, that takes all the fun out of it. <laughs> no, but they're still used to that cold weather. Well, it's going to be an exciting time, and I know you'll be glued, because I know your, your husband, Norman, is a real Skins fan. And He's you know, a fanatic about yeah, the skins. He is. And the funny thing is, it's become infectious. When I first came to America, I didn't understand American football, why everything took so long, you know, why did you have to keep <laughs> stopping, get on with it. Um, I didn't understand anything, but now that he's explained it a little to me, I love it. I think it's a wonderful game. Well, when I first came down here from Canada, I thought American football was for wimps because you have one extra down, and we have 10 yards longer in our Canadian field. But I've kind of gotten into it here as well. But I still think it's Bills and three. We'll see you Monday. <laughs> I laugh. <laughs> well, looking at today's show, women in the media have come a long way, baby, over the last 20 years. Currently, one in every three broadcast reporters is a woman, and this gives a feminist slant to the news. In the media elite, women were more likely to favor not only a pro-choice position than were men, women were more likely to favor gay rights, they were more likely to believe that Adultery is not wrong. We'll take a look at more on women in the media coming up, Dave. Plus, stay tuned for the heavyweight champion of the world. Evander Holyfield shares his inside perspective on a big boxing controversy. That's just ahead. And also, hope is ahead for patients suffering with cancer. Cancer is such a, such a devastating word, and such a, a terminating word. And I couldn't believe that this was happening to me. Well, this priest, plus the parents of a boy with cancer, tell their incredible stories in today's 700 Club. And perhaps if you or someone in your family is suffering with this and facing this at the moment, and maybe you're filled with fear, having been given that kind of prognosis, we want you to feel free to call. We're going to pray for you today and pray that somehow in your life, God will do a miracle. Sheila, this uh, particular cancer issue is particularly uh, meaningful to me. Just this past week, uh, my spiritual mother, Marion Pointer, called, and she's been having a battle with cancer now for several years and looked like she was clear of it. But the doctors just this week found cancer on her liver, and so we're going to be praying for her and as well as praying for you. So please give us a call, 800 or 804 420 700 if you have a special need today, particularly in the healing area. Well, in the news, as President Bush's State of the Union speech draws nearer, the economy continues to dominate the national agenda. One potential topic of discussion in the president's speech, more government benefits for those Americans who have lost their jobs. CBN News White House correspondent Ken Lorman has this report. The staggering U.S. economy continues to present problems for the Bush administration. The latest barometer is unemployment claims, which climbed once again. Political observers say expect Mr. Bush to call for an extension of jobless benefits in Tuesday's State of the Union address. Debate over the extension is not expected to be as contentious and partisan as last year. With a presidential election months away and unemployment at 7.1% last month, Democrats are saying they will negotiate with Mr. Bush on how to pay for the program. Despite initially proposing the president declare an emergency to let government borrow money, top Democrats say they now agree with Republicans that the measure should be paid for, if possible, without boosting the budget deficit. With bad economic news and continued bashing from Democrats, Tuesday's State of the Union address is becoming increasingly more important to the president. Some political observers say it could be the most important speech he's given since his acceptance address at the GOP convention in New Orleans. Ken Lorman, CBN News, Washington. This is a tough issue because economists tell you that if we do this and extend these benefits, it will bankrupt the nation. But it, to me, it's a, a no-win situation because there are so many good people who are hurting right now. I got a letter yesterday from a woman that just was heartbreaking, asking if there's any way that we could help her. Her husband has been looking for a job, would take anything to support his wife and family, can't find one. He's so depressed, he's landed in a mental facility, and she's about to be evicted from her home with her two children. That homelessness is striking people that it never hit before. 
that I just don't know what the answer is. It's a heart, heartbreaking situation. Well, the most secure strata to be in in society has been the middle class, but what's happened now is that the middle class has been invaded with this whole problem of unemployment. And again, as you said, the problem is a short-term one, and if we don't do the right thing in the short-term, long-term-wise, we could have even greater problems. But when people are struggling with how they're going to make their house payment, how they're going to feed their children, they're going to look for those quick fix programs. And we'll be watching very closely Tuesday night what President Bush has to say about his immediate plans for the economy. And again, it's hard to be in the president's shoes in this kind of situation. He's a compassionate man, but he also has to keep the long range view in mind for the country as well. But I do feel, too, that during this time, it's a time when we, as the church in this nation, have got to nail our colors to the mast. Perhaps in your congregation, there are those who are not doing so well right now. Maybe they're struggling. And, you know, you can show Christ's love in so many ways by cooking a meal and taking mm -hmm. over to someone, taking a family that you know is struggling out for dinner, not asking them, you know, can I help you? Because sometimes people are embarrassed to say they need something. But just call them up and say, you know, we would like to take you for dinner on Friday night. If we can move in at the moment and help people when they're hurting, I think that that would show the love of Christ to many people. Well, many of our brothers and sisters in China are growing in numbers, but also suffering greater persecution. And here at home, Christians in Minnesota prepare to reach out to Super Bowl fans with the gospel. Richard Hunt has these stories and more from today's CBN News Desk. Recently, CBN News reported on the growth of Christianity in China and the government's crackdown on the church. Restrictions on religion there are continuing. The New York Times says the Communist State Education Commission has warned secondary school students against practicing religion. Nearly 200 Christians are currently in jail for their religious activities, and communist officials have restricted the permitted number of sanctioned clergy. The increased restrictions appear to be a response to growing interest in Christianity across China, as well as the government's fear of the church because of its role in the Romanian and the Polish revolutions. Authorities in Florida are facing a very different kind of situation. Gangs of transvestites there are stealing millions of dollars worth of dresses. The Wall Street Journal reports that the label-conscious burglary ring of more than 100 female impersonators is preying on designer women's shops around the state. Some area boutique owners have even been forced to close their shops following repeated break-ins. Christians in Minnesota are getting ready for the Super Bowl in a super way. According to the National and International Religion Report, a coalition of several hundred churches has set a Super Bowl goal of reaching a million people for Christ. One group is widely distributing a sports magazine containing professional Christian football player profiles and instructions for salvation. A hundred high school assemblies have been held over the last three weeks at which the pro stars have reached out to the kids. And local church members are hosting in-home super party videos for neighbors and showing a 15-minute Christian athlete evangelism video at halftime. The weekend festivities will be kicked off tonight with a first, an NFL-sanctioned gospel music concert at the St. Paul Civic Center. Nearly 4,000 Christians gathered at the Civic Center in early November to pray for the Super Bowl outreach effort. At CBN News Desk, I'm Richard Hunt. Well, that's a great response, great isn't it, to the Super Bowl? And uh, maybe that's something uh, our viewers could do uh, to get a hold of one of those videos and participate in some way. But we need to take every opportunity to appropriately present the fact that Jesus Christ is really the most important thing in life. And also the Christians can minister to all those that's Bills right. fans when they come out of the press. <laughs> She's not going to give up on it, ladies and gentlemen. Bills by three, but we won't emphasize that anymore. How much aid should the new Commonwealth of Independent States receive? Well, the members of the Commonwealth are hoping for as much as they can get, and they may be willing to go to, go to desperate measures to get that money. George Carden brings us this report. Governments have always had to decide which part of their budget should get more attention, guns or butter. But in a post-Cold War world with the former Soviet Union facing famine and depression, the sudden cry is, forget the guns, we're starving for butter. The outside world has now committed $78 billion of aid to the Commonwealth of Independent States. Ironically, almost all of these countries were foes of the former Soviet Union. But now they're loading up their army trucks and Air Force jets to fly food and emergency supplies to their ex-enemies. The United States Air Force will fly 54 sorties of criti critical medical and food shipments to cities in Russia and the new independent states. One economist advising Boris Yeltsin says Russia needs $18 billion to stabilize its out-of-control economy. He points out that's just 10% of NATO's budget, and many NATO countries are taking his hint seriously, using money that would have gone to NATO's military for bailing out what used to be NATO's only enemy. Congress has taken to the same idea when it decided to spend half a billion dollars to help the ex-Soviets centralize or destroy their nuclear weapons. The money came out of the Pentagon's budget. 
and some congressmen have proposed using 1 to 3 percent of that military budget to aid the Commonwealth. What's the logic behind all this? It's the idea that military money diverted to helping Russia's fledgling democracy is the very best way to put a final end to the hyper-expensive Cold War arms race. Right now, one of their top defense officials is proposing that the four million member Soviet military be slashed in half. He says the Commonwealth just can't afford a military that big anymore. And the ex-Soviets are chopping their weapons purchases some 80 percent. They're spending the money to feed and house the troops instead. The CIA says the cutbacks appear to be across the board and everything from bombers to subs to nuclear missiles. Their people say they have the capability to dismantle about 1,500 warheads a year. Uh, they claim they're going to take down about 15,000. These huge Commonwealth cuts are feeding the fever to hack the Pentagon budget. Many Americans think whatever savings result from this peace dividend should all be spent at home. But pulling the ex-Soviets through their tough times will probably remain a top U.S. priority. And some in the cash-poor but weapons-rich Commonwealth are keeping the pressure on for more Western aid. Ukraine has gone so far as to threaten that it will start selling deadly Soviet weapons to other nations if substantial Western aid doesn't arrive soon. Our economy, like the other republics, is in the state of crisis. And yes, we'll sell arms if we have to. And I confirm we have potential customers already. And indeed, if it's a matter of starving to death or selling their most valuable weapons, it's easy to understand why our past Cold War enemies may end up selling tools of destruction to those who may be America's future foes. George Carden, CBN News. Sheila, this is really serious, and I'm a little upset, obviously, I think, and having been in the Ukraine for a couple of days and just seeing the, the spirit of the people, it really troubles me that their leaders now are saying, we're going to hold the West hostage. If you don't get the aid to us fast enough, quick enough, then we're going to start selling off our nuclear weaponry. And the implication that they'll sell it to the highest bidder is the most frightening of all. That's nuclear blackmail, isn't it? It really it's is. terrible. I have real mixed feelings on the whole situation in Russia. I know that we have to move in and help mm -hmm. those people to stabilize, to get them over the hump of this terrible winter. But I still do struggle with the fact that we can, as Pat Buchanan said last night, get an aid package together for mm -hmm. Russia in a few days. And yet on our streets there are people starving who have nothing and we don't seem to be able to help them. Of course the key here is the people on the streets don't have nuclear weapons to bargain with and that's going to be part of the stress and tension we'll face over the next several weeks and months. Mm. Well today we want to ask a question. Do women journalists report the news differently than men? There is clear evidence that they do and many of them have an agenda that surveys show most women don't share. Mark Gilman brings us this report. At one time, the lone female reporter was the rare exception in a male-dominated newsroom. But today, women are a prominent force in the fourth estate. Every major news service in the country has at least one woman on the political trail today in New Hampshire. And the total female journalist now serving as managing editors on newspapers has doubled in the past 10 years. In the electronic media, one out of every three reporters is a woman. But while most are quick to praise the strides female journalists have finally made in the past 20 years, some claim some women are also using their new positions of power as a platform to promote a left-wing feminist agenda. Our survey of major media journalists some years back found that in the media elite, women were more likely to favor not only a pro-choice position than were men, Women were more likely to favor gay rights. They were more likely to believe that adultery is not wrong. Media watchdog and researcher Robert Lichter says the problem is that those feminist liberal stands taken by some newswomen are coming out in their reporting of major events. A case in point, the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill hearings. In a study of stories generated during the hearings, Lichter reports that 74% of the stories written by women criticized Judge Thomas, while 75% praised Professor Anita Hill. That, he said, gave the false impression that women were rising up against the male establishment. Actual surveys of women nationwide showed that this simply was not true. The majority of American women supported Clarence Thomas. Another case showing the new liberal clout women in the media possess, the LA Times, in a series called Sex and the Press, attributed female journalists for bringing the AIDS issue to the front pages of America's newspapers. The story equated the rise in prominent AIDS-related story coverage in the past decade to the rise in ranks of female editors. The article claimed that one of the prominent factors was that while male editors viewed the AIDS dilemma as a predominantly homosexual issue, women viewed it as one of human tragedy, 
adding that female journalists tend to have more gay friends while senior males tend to be uncomfortable around homosexuals. Washington Post Newsweek Television Bureau Chief Tina Galan says the women she knows in the business don't necessarily have an agenda, but she isn't apologizing for the influence women have recently attained in the media. She says it adds a needed perspective. Well, sure, it's affected media coverage. It's like saying when there were no blacks, no Hispanics, no women in newsrooms, did, did we have um, uh, a news perspective that was dominated by white males? Sure we did. That didn't mean that the white males were bad. It meant that they had a perspective that was in some sense limited. But for some journalists, Lichter's liberal charge does not offend. UPI's Helen Thomas is the dean of White House reporters. Once the lone woman in a male-dominated Washington political scene, Thomas has been the constant thorn of seven White House administrations. And she says the fact that she is a woman doesn't necessarily disqualify her from having feelings. We didn't rule ourselves out of the human race when we became reporters. I mean, we have the right to think, to feel, to care, to believe. She also wants Lichter to know that she doesn't especially look at the liberal tag as being a negative. And what's wrong with being liberal? What if you, you mean you care for the poor, the sick, and the homeless, and the, the maimed? Is that wrong? What's wrong, according to Lichter, is that female journalists are taking not just personal, but liberal editorial stands on issues like abortion. And that lack of objective reporting is helping to sway public 